Good afternoon. Oh, this thing is on. That's nice. Uh, we're going to start with just a simple question. How many of you all paid money to get here by bus, metro, Uber, Lyft, rickshaw, what have you? Okay, good. Thanks for supporting the transportation industry. How many of you have already recorded that expense in some electronic form you can look up later on? That's why we're here. <laughs> My name is Rob Pegarero, and I haven't had a real job in about six and a half years. I've been freelancing full time and um, still uh, living in a house, not in the street. So far, so good. And we're going to talk about the things I've learned and more important. My co-partner here has been at this much longer is going to share her wisdom. So hi, everyone. Thank you for being here for the last session. Everyone, way to stick with it. We know we're the only thing between y'all and a reception. <laughs> My name's Katherine Reynolds Lewis, and I have been an independent journalist since 2008. I like to say independent journalist because I am not free. I'm very expensive. <laughs> I started freelancing in um, November 2008, which you may remember was also the worst year of the Great Recession. So I um, learned the hard way. All of the tips that I'm going to give are attached to a very sad story of a mistake that I made. I, um, I'm currently actually uh, just finishing a book. So I haven't been um, doing articles for a while, but I'm happy to talk about how I went from um, you know, writing for magazines and online to, to the book. And I'm um, excited to see so many people interested in this topic. Just curious, who here is already actively freelancing? Awesome. And how many of you are full-time? Excellent. Okay, and who is interested in starting freelancing? Okay, good. Very exciting. So uh, throughout, you know, we'll be interested in if any, any of you have input, you know, let's make this as open a discussion as we can. So we're going to do this in three, three sort of big segments. The first is all about uh, self-flackery. The second is going to be the really fun stuff, accounting. And third will be client management. We'll stop to take questions after each one so you don't have to you know, get in your urgent Schedule C query when someone else wants to talk about LinkedIn. So I'm going to let Catherine take the lead on the first part. I'll, I'll do accounting even though I suck at math. And then uh, she takes the lead on client management. So one of the big questions people talk about is how do you find work, right? How do you promote yourself as a freelancer? And um, I, when I started in freelancing, I knew that this was going to be such an important part of my work that every Monday, I called it Marketing Mondays, I just devoted the whole day to outreach. And you want to start by making a list of everyone that you know, have ever worked with, or have ever known. And, you know, start at the mo with the most likely people who are in journalism. But you never know who you're going to get work from. I actually, a couple years ago, had a new excellent client, a nonprofit, who came to me through my middle school friend. And I mean, I like to think at 12 I was a good writer, but, you know, it was really because she knew me, she saw my work over the years, and she remembered, oh yeah, Catherine writes when they needed a writer. So start with that long list, anyone you know, and just systematically go through, reach out, ask for coffees, ask for lunches, ask for phone calls. Don't just stop with the email, because emails we all know, or however, text messages are, are so easy to, to, to overlook. So you want to you know, reach out, and as positive as you can be, we're not desperate. We have a wonderful service that we're providing that people need. So as much as you can reach out in that positive mindset, um, I remember the first year after I um, started freelancing, I went to the Asian American Journalist Association, one of my favorite professional groups, and I ran into an old friend who was like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm freelancing. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm choosing to freelance. I am not using it as code for unemployed. So you need to present that and make sure people understand this is really what you want to do and you have a lot to, to offer. So that would, but the first thing I would say is just always be marketing with a positive outlook, be open-minded about where your work might come, and as much as possible, work through your existing networks. Spend, spend your time with people who know you, who know your work, and who want to share that value with their networks as well. And then... Um, the other thing would be is if you target a, an outlet that you want to freelance for, try to get a warm introduction. So 
use LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever you use to keep track of your network to find someone who knows someone at that organization and ask them for an introduction. Because that's always gonna, you know, the emails that you open are the ones that say, John Berger suggested I email with a story idea. It's a name of someone that they know. Um, my other really favorite trick is the I will be in your neighborhood on Tuesday. Because I can be in pretty much any neighborhood on Tuesday. <laughs> so, you know, someone I'm, who's ignoring my emails or who can't get pinned down, I'll say, hey, next week I'm going to be in New York on Wednesday or Thursday. Do you have time for five minutes for coffee? And if they say yes, then I book a bus to New York. So Rob, I know, has a lot of um, ideas about the sort of online aspect of marketing. I too. definitely concur. You know, if you can find someone you know who works at a place, you know, if you have an idea for a story, go to that site's masthead. You probably know someone or know someone who works there. You know, you might find the one place where a, a story idea sent in to their submissions at email address works. If you do, please let me know. Um, I got a few sort of more bullet point items. Uh, one thing you should try to do pretty regularly, when you search for your own name, which we all do all the time, we know it, what site shows up at the top of that list and do you control it? If the answer is something like LinkedIn where you're sort of filling in a template that's not so good, ideally it would be some wonderful blog where you're doing great original content that makes enough money to support you, but at least have it be some site, even if it's your Tumblr, Tumblr blog or whatever, that you're in charge of and that presents you effectively. Uh, second of all, make sure people can reach you. I see so many people, someone uh, at replied to me on Twitter yesterday and I realized I cannot get to this person. They don't have an email address in their Twitter bio. The website they link to in their bio also has no contact information. So I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, I just have my email in my bio because I got tired of PR people saying, please follow me so I can DM you. I'm like, could you please use email? It exists for a reason, I assure you. You will get the question, especially if you run into people you used to work with, that's this vaguely existential one, where are you at? Have a good, positive answer, like, you know, mine is, well, I read for Yahoo Finance, do a consumer q and column for USA Today, I do various guides for the wire cutter, and sometimes if you're in a place where there's a lot of wire cutter fans, lead with that, people love the wire cutter. Uh, a couple other things, we mentioned LinkedIn, it's easy to look on that site as being this nexus of marketing droids, which it is, but you should be good at it. Have a profile that's filled out, that's kept current, that has a picture of you that is, you know, not some out of focus selfie that looks professional. You can get work through that. And yes, I know it's annoying. If you've had conversations with people here that you enjoyed, send them a LinkedIn request. But for the love of God, don't use the default text. I probably know how to say, I would like to add you to my professional network in 15 different languages because of LinkedIn. Send something like, we had a great chat at ONA, or a nice meeting you Tuesday, something like that. Um, business cards. It's worth taking some time so you have them ready. Hand them out, all, have a bunch to hand out at all times. I've got like 20 in the back of my badge here, if anyone wants to reach me. Um, yes, it's old school, it actually works. You can, if you're into design, you can have some fun putting them together. And um, I did bring one shiny object, this is a 15% off code for Moo.com, which is where I got my cards. They just sent me that in the mail. So if anyone wants it, please come up. And lastly, there's probably some obvious handle people know you by. First name, last name, or if you have some particular handle you've used on a bunch of social media sites, do you have the .com version of that registered? I realize if your name is John Smith, that's not going to happen. But, you know, try to have that at least stashed away so no one else uses it. And with that, we were, we've through the first part of it, let's take some questions on this. Or suggestions of your own. All the way in the back. Uh, definitely not .biz, or there, there's some really tacky domain names, like .net is not bad. You know, that's got an internet-ish thing. .org, although suggest you're a nonprofit, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I had to do Catherine R. Lewis, my middle initial, and I also have Catherine Reynolds Lewis. I would say don't do, you know, real, your first name, last name, because Donald Trump has ruined that for everybody. That branding strategy doesn't work anymore. And I would also say that your best leads are going to come from people who meet you in person or who are referred to you. So the website is sort of for them to check you out and make sure that you're legit or see what your portfolio is. 
Um, another thing I forgot to mention before is, of course, meeting people at conferences like this is a really great way to market yourself. I um, spoke at the AJA conference a few years ago as well about a panel just like this, how to succeed as a freelancer, and that's how I started writing for the New York Times because in the audience was an editor for the New York Times who was looking for freelancers, and after I spoke, he came up and said, hey, we'd love to have you write for us. So being visible in the organizations you're part of, it just even reminds people you exist. Because the people who know you like you, they know you do good work, but sometimes they forget you exist. And so if you're on the newsletter or if you're on the website of the ONA chapter in your area, then they're like, oh yeah, 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 Catherine exists. I like her, I should get her some work. I mean, that is where that whole where are you at question is coming from, because it's not obvious. You don't have an employer attached to you, so you have to sort of figure out some way that people will realize that, yes, you're here, you're available for work at a decent rate. Any other questions about marketing yourself or Should we get on to the fun stuff? Okay, in the front. Um, the American Society of Journalists and Authors is a exclusively for independent nonfiction writers, book authors, and you know, uh, I mean, are people here writers? Raise your hand if you write. Um, okay, raise your hand if you're in video. Probably everyone does everything, right? <laughs> we all pivoted to video too. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it sort of depends on your industry. That's a great one for writing. Um, the um, um, binders for any women, Binders Full of Women is a great resource. Um, I would say all of the affinity groups have um, good freelance networks. The Society of Professional Journalists has a freelance network that's pretty active. Yeah, exactly. I, I would say there's also, so look for sort of not region specific groups that cover whatever you, particular, whatever you write about in particular. You know, if you cover technology, there's various you know, groups of people who complain about their CMSs. If you cover aviation, there, there's all sorts of subgroups there. But also look for, you know, are there local groups just for freelancers? If you're in DC, there's a good Facebook group called Freelance DC, where people sort of pass around lots of tips, say, hey, I need a designer, or anyone know who's some, no, do, do we know anybody who's good at WordPress? I need this, uh, this site redone. Yeah, oh, I would also say um, network to, you know, adjacent industries. So graphic designers often have client flow that needs writers. Um, you know, p people who are also independent but don't do exactly what you do. Um, and of course, volunteering to organize a panel for a conference. You can invite the editors you want to pitch. So, you know, that's oh. for ASJ, I volunteered to organize a, pa a panel and I invited an editor from The New Yorker, The Atlantic, the New Republic and got to know them really it's well. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Always open my emails if I ever pitch you. So, All right, over there. Well, that's a good question. So you reminded me, I do actually have a page at about.me, uh, which I haven't checked in a while. I should log in to make sure it hasn't been hacked. Uh, you know, I decided to set up a page at wordpress.com. The, the approximate reason for it was uh, in the spring of 2011, the Washington Post was getting rid of my column and I was negotiating my severance and no one knew. So we needed some way to announce this and I didn't want to have to run it through the Post copy desk. So I'm like, oh, right, I, I should probably get a blog. I hear it's a thing. And so I adopted WordPress, and I've since realized like I like having some place where I can get something off my chest right away and sort of, you know, sum up what I've done each week. It's sort of a nice bit of mental discipline. I like that. But I also spend too much time thinking of clever subject headers when I email my wife. So I would need some place to write anyways. Placeholder business card kind of site wouldn't be, too, wouldn't be so good for me in particular. I'm sure that we're, we got this under control. Can people hear me okay? Oh, great, awesome. So I would say um, as many as you can maintain. So I'm on like Twitter, Facebook, I have my own domain, but I really, it's a static page. It's basically just a portfolio. Um, I have my portfolio also on Muckrack. Um, but one of, 
Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So I started freelancing after being a, new, a national correspondent for Newhouse News Service, and they laid us off. And I, I, at the point, it was the worst time in the Great Recession, so I'm like, well, if I take another job, I'm just going to be laid off two months later. But um, one of the things they did, they set up a small business consulting, you know, as part of our severance. And the consultant said, look, you're not a successful independent contractor unless you have three clients. So like one is your mom or your grandma. Two could be a coincidence, but if you have three clients, then you may have a good business here. So don't spend so much time setting up a website, maintaining your social presence, until you actually get the clients. You know, that's what you should worry about first, to know if you're gonna even be viable before you go to the trouble and spend a lot of time on the presence and marketing yourself. All right, it's now, should we go on to the next part? Sure. The really fun stuff? Yeah. All right, accounting, this is, I really sucked at this the first year. I got some two bits of basic advice that really helped, uh, and then a lot of stuff I had to learn from scratch. So we'll start with the really basic stuff. Get an employer ID number so you're not giving your social security number to every random client. I mean, I know Equifax has already distributed your SSN to the world, but let's not make it too easy for the identity thieves. Get the EIN, you'll feel a little more professional, and it takes like a minute on the IRS's site. Not hard at all to do. Uh, and second, the, the best piece of advice I got starting out is put all your business expenses on one credit card, get a business bank account, because, I don't know, I'd always feel a little ooky handing out my real personal home checking account, the one I share with my wife, to a random client so they can do direct deposit. I feel a little more professional having a business account. And because what you need to be able to do is know what you've spent. And, and this is... You know, if nothing else, for tax purposes, it can be helpful to, to make as less money than you actually did, but you need to actually know what you spent, when, and where. Because the Schedule C tax form is your friend as a freelancer, but it's no good unless you have this information. So with that, then you need some way to tag expenses as they happen. And that's where I was going with my question about if you took a taxi or a metro or a bus here, did you record that? Anything you spend doing your business, that counts. And you'll see bad advice. TurboTax will say, you, you can't record uh, local transit unless you're traveling. Actually, the IRS form says you can't record local transit if it is to a regular place of work. If you work from home, every time you step out of the house, you're gone somewhere. It's a business trip, a very short business trip on the orange line or whatever. Um, so what I wound up doing after a while, the first year, I, I remember sitting down to do my taxes like I'd paid a pro to do them. I wasn't a complete idiot. And the guy says, yeah, okay, I'm gonna need these bits of data. And he must have lost money, because I had to go back to him again and again. And I realized, yeah, so I have in my calendar, I went to these things, I should probably, you know, the metro expenses have to add up. It is unbelievably annoying to have to recreate those things based on, okay, a fare from uh, the Clarendon Station to McPherson Square is this much during rush hour, over and over again. And I really wanted to smash my head into a wall at the end of this. So now, having become less of an idiot, I just have a Google Doc spreadsheet in my phone. You know, I tap my fare card, get out of the station, and as I'm on the escalator up, I pull up the spreadsheet, punch in, you know, October 7th, uh, Metro, $2.40, reason, ONA. And I have the spreadsheet, and then I can, what I do to manage all my finances, Intuit has the site called mint.com, which has the advantage of mostly tagging expenses correctly. Sometimes it gets them catastrophically wrong. But what it also lets you do is tag expenses. So I have a freelance journalism tag. Every check that comes in, every payment I get, every expense I incur, I tag it with that. And then I can ex export that as a .csv spreadsheet file. I told you this was going to be fascinating. And then import it into the Google Doc. And then, boom, it says, you spent this much on travel. You spent this much on meals and entertainment. Your business supplies expenses, business cards, in-flight Wi-Fi, whatever was this much, and I can plug that into TurboTax. You have to actually do my taxes now once again because I really like punishment. There's a, re there's a reason I'm a journalist in the first place. And the weird thing is after years of incompetent accounting, I realized I sort of actually like knowing what the heck is going on with my business. And because, let's see, what else do we have here? And after about four years, I took another step towards really being less of an idiot, which was, hey, I should actually get a sense of whether I'm making money. So now I actually add up what I make each quarter and what my expenses are. Are these things going the right way? 
So I can tell you Q2 kind of, Q3 this year kind of sucked. I need to do better in the last quarter. I want to finish strong and, you know, hopefully not make less money than last year. And the big thing, estimated taxes. Repeat these dates after me. April 18th, 2018, June 15th, 2018, September 15th, 2018, and January 16th, 2019. The four dates for filing estimated taxes. If you make freelance, if, you, if you're doing reasonably well as a freelancer, you will have to file it for the, your estimated taxes ahead of time. The directions on the IRS site are insane. They want you to like basically do your taxes from scratch and then do the AMT. Just budget for 20% of what you make. You can set up automated payments of this at a site the IRS runs called uh, EFTPS. I can't remember what it stands for, EFTPS.gov. Don't let that stuff wait. You don't want to have to scrape together a whole lot of money in April. It's okay if you file for an extension. I've only not filed for an extension once since 2011. You got to do this stuff. And the other annoying thing is saving for retirement, which may seem abstract, but in the near term, it has the advantage that it lowers what you will owe to the IRS. And so again, it took me years and years to realize you know, I know I'm trying to really fine tune this, but I should just set aside this much, have this much put into this Vanguard fund every month, and hopefully it'll all sort of come out in the end. Well, we'll see how I do in April. Check back with me on that. What would you like to add to this hilarious and uh, engrossing <laughs> discussion, I'm sure? Well, since Rob covered um, the expenses side, I'll talk a little bit about the income side and how to set your rate. So I have an Excel spreadsheet uh, that has a monthly target that I know I need to make at least X amount and um, to survive, to pay my basic expenses. And as I'm getting assignments throughout the month, I log them into that spreadsheet and I have this little knot of panic until I hit that target. I don't stop, obviously. I keep pitching and marketing until I, you know, the month is over. But when I, when I hit that base, I know I'm okay. And um, that also serves as my one-stop shop. It also serves as where I keep track of invoices that I need to send. I keep track of when they're paid. Um, and that has just been my, um, my go-to. I didn't actually include it as a handout, but if anyone wants me to email them um, the spreadsheet, I can like leave a sign-up sheet, and I'd be happy to email um, that. And then um, talking about rates. So rates are like a huge thing, obviously. People say, what's your rate? What would you charge for that? So my, the first thing I would say is if you're a writer, people talk a lot about the per word rate, right? Or maybe you, you're writing for an online layout that and they say, well, it's $500 a story. And that's great for them. But for you, you need to know how much am I getting paid per hour? Because if we're freelancers, we are trading our time for money. We are not getting any kind of stock in the company that we are working for. We're not, um, now that I actually have a book, um, which is the good news about bad behavior, which is coming out in April about kids and discipline, I actually will have some residual income after I'm done writing. But this is the first time since 2008 that I'm not going to just walk away from the client and be never get any more money. So. I always calculate my own estimate of whatever hourly rate I'm gonna get. So if I'm getting, getting paid $500 for a thousand word story, I say, okay, well, if I wanna make $100 an hour, I cannot spend more than five hours on that story. So maybe that means three hours reporting, one hour writing, and two hours, one hour for editing. And using that number for the rate, you can see, um, this is my little, my, my cheat sheet of, if you wanna work reasonable hours per, um, week per year and have a little time off for sick or for vacation. You need to charge at least um, $43 an hour to make $50,000. And this is assuming that you're going to have a certain amount, 40% for overhead. And all these handouts are also on the ONA website under speaker resources for our session. So you can find them there, um, <clears throat> although you're also welcome to take our picture. Um, then if you go down the sheet, you see to make more money than 50000 you need to charge $65 an hour to make $75,000 a year, $86 an hour to make $100,000 a year, and that has to cover our health insurance, our retirement. Like Rob, I have a um, self-employed... Um, I have a self-employed 401k plan, so I try to put as much as possible into it. And I was putting in 
um, $25,000 a year until I started writing a book in the last two years. I have not contributed to it, but um, I plan to again next year. Um, so once you have that hourly rate that is your mental target for how you can get to your needed monthly income, stick to that rate. Don't get distracted by the per word rate. And yes, you sometimes will get a new client and you think it's gonna take you five hours and it takes you 20. So you just suck it up and maybe don't work for that client again. Because if you keep working for people who pay you too little to, to live, you are gonna be on a hamster wheel that is going too fast for you and you're running too slow. It is better to use your time marketing yourself to get better clients than to take something that pays too little. In freelancing, we often talk about the anchor client, sort of this elusive, wonderful client exist, that's going to really? pay you enough that you don't have to worry every month. And the anchor client can take a lot of forms. Um, uh, it's kind of lined up wrong. So it could be like a regular newsletter, a regular column. It could be part a part-time job. It could be a non-journalism job where you're not getting exhausted by the the what you're doing to make your nut and you're actually able to come home and write or whatever create whatever content you create. Um, it could be a severance package, which is what I had when um, New House um, closed. Um, it could be a spouse, <laughs> um, but whatever it is that that anchor client. <laughs> That anchor client will give you the freedom to turn down bad gigs. And that is your fastest path to success as a freelancer is being able to turn down work because then you're in charge, you're driving your own career, you're not just relying on whatever crumbs come your way. A couple of the things I'd add. Um, you do need to have some way to keep track of invoicing. And it can be difficult because people do it different ways. I have one client where it's uh, a Google form I fill out uh, another one, it's done through this site called Work Market. Most of the time, I'm sending a uh, PDF invoice to someone, and I have a very sophisticated system for tracking when I get paid. When I send the invoice, it goes in an invoices owed folder. When I get paid, I move to the invoices paid folder. Very high tech. Some people, you can do QuickBooks, you can do lots of, there's lots of different ways to do this. Find some way where you don't forget, where you at least can see, you know, am I getting the money I'm supposed to get? Uh, and the other thing, one of the weirder to-do list items I have on my phone, a repeating one, is January 1st, record car mileage. To count your car mileage as an expense on your schedule, see here is this lovely document, isn't it enthralling? Uh, you need to know exactly how many miles you drove in the year, or at least have a good idea of it. And the simplest way is January 1st, in your hungover stupor, turn on the car, write down the mileage, and do that every January 1st, and then you just need to log each trip as it occurs. And, you know, again, it's anything that is connected to your work. And you don't technically need to record the start and end mileage. Google directions are pretty accurate. If you have Google recording your location history, that works as well. Don't forget to record taxes and tolls separately because those are also Schedule C food. And with that, what, can you have any wonky financial questions we can answer? Bearing in mind, neither of us are professional accountants. If there are any CPAs in the room, this is going to get ugly. Yeah? You had mentioned Yeah, I mean, I will admit there are a couple of times where I've put like an airfare on my personal Amex because, you know, Amex has these offers they always throw out. So I'm not going to turn down free money and I just have to remember tag that as freelance journalism and it all goes in the same pot. Question? You mean if they wait too long to pay you? Yeah, yeah. it takes too long. Yeah. Or they say, I'm going to pay you the money, and you're following up. Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it is just one of the worst Start sweating things a about a freelancer. <laughs> so um, so I, I feel like as a, as a freelancer, you 
have to actively manage your client portfolio. And a client who takes too long to pay just sort of gets edged into that category of clients I want to drop as soon as I get a better client. Um, my good clients, they pay direct deposit, they pay in 25 days, I send an electronic invoice and they put the money in my bank 25 days later. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that you often just find out through trial and error, but through some of the um, freelance organizations or networks, you can find out who are those bad clients yep. who, who are slow to pay. So I actually have a client, I know they're gonna take two months before I even, they even think about paying me. And a lot of times I'll have to remind them three times. So I just, I actually like writing for them. I get a good per hour rate because they're easy stories to do and the rate is good. So I just know that that's gonna, that client, I'm not gonna see that money for three months. And I sort of mentally say, I, I cannot use that money until January. Um, so you make the decision in your head, why am I doing this gig? Are you doing it for pay? This is my three Ps rule. Are you doing it for pay? for personal satisfaction or for the prestige because it's gonna move your career forward. If you're doing it for pay, do not lose sight of that motive. And if you, as you start analyzing your time spent and the hourly rate, if you determine you are not making your hourly rate, drop that client or make a plan to drop that client as soon as you can. If you're doing it for personal satisfaction, you may not make your hourly rate, but it, it's okay because you are doing that because you really want to tell that story. And if you're doing it for prestige, again, the pay may not be as important. And actually, I think of it as the clients that I'm doing just for pay, I have to make more than my hourly rate to subsidize writing a book proposal. You know, things that I'm not going to get paid potentially ever, or certainly not for a while. So um, I hope that helps. You know, it's, it's just one of those things that as much as you can, ASJA has, um, has a great, if you're a member, you can look on the pay, you know, they have a bad pay, good pay um, log of, you know, with reports, they call it paycheck report, where you can see who are the clients who typically pay late or you have to hound them. So you pretty soon can figure out, you know, who are the people who are going to pay you regularly and who you're going to have to hound. Yeah, net 30 days should be, you shouldn't see anything worse than that. I've been very lucky in six years of freelancing. I've never had someone not pay me. I've had people pay me late and usually it's somebody forgot was stuck on somebody's desk or their screen, uh, and you have to nag them. And when you do nag them, if you usually do with your, your editor through email, call them. If you usually call them, I don't know, show up outside their home and do reenact that scene from Love Actually with the big signs. Uh, do something to get their attention, and you should be okay. Or Hopefully. <laughs> or find out the you know accounts payable person. Often your editor oh, isn't really the person who can control the money, but it, they don't want to deal with it. So if you say, hey, you know, put me in touch with whoever in accounts payable cuts the checks or processes the invoices, that person is maybe a much better contact because you don't have to worry about your relationship as much with that person. Um, and then the, the other thing I would say is if it's a client you want to keep, but they're really awful at paying, ask them for the money up front or ask them for half up front. And if they want to keep you as a resource, they will have to do that. And I've, I've certainly done that myself. With clients, I started out getting paid after the gig, and when they were so slow, I said, you know what, I, to keep my accountant, blame someone else, my accountant will not let me take any more work unless I get a third up front or a half up front. All the way in the back. I myself in that situation where I am you know, going through um, uh, the, the writing a uh, um, memoir with political insights for the time in the Middle East. And so any secrets that you have on, on that path would be amazing. Um, sure, I'm happy to share what happened with me. So when I um, left Newhouse in 2008, I'm like, finally, I get to write my book. And then I like was just scrambling to pay my bills and I did nothing. So in 2009, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna write my book. And again, I'm just like, it's hard to do. So finally, I got myself an accountability buddy. So every Friday, 
Um, actually, she's my second accountability buddy. At first, my friend Sarah and I were like, okay, we're gonna check in every week, set goals for the next week, and then report back on how we did. And so we check in every Friday, and I'd be like, I didn't meet my goals, and she'd be like, neither did I. Okay, talk to you next week. <laughs> so then I got an accountability buddy I was a little bit scared of, um, and I wanted to impress just a little bit. And so I was just humiliated to report to her every Friday I have not spent the two hours writing you know, something towards my book that I promised I would. Um, and so that got, my, got me rolling on the project. And really, just a small amount of time every week will help. I did it first thing Monday morning, and it snowballed. So I started um, working on this after an ASJA conference where David Dobbs, does anyone know the science writer? He was on the panel, and he said, you know, the way you get a book deal is you write an article for a big magazine, um, hope it gets some attention, and then that gets an agent interested or that gets a publisher interested. It's market proof that someone wants to read what you have to say. And so I wrote a pitch, I pitched it around, Mother Jones, said yes, and the article I wrote for them called The End of Punishment actually went viral. It ended up being the most read piece the magazine had ever published. And I just saw Clara Jeffries here, and she said they're still getting traffic on the piece. And so that got me a great agent who got a lot of interest from publishers and multiple offers. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Along the way, there are terrific resources to help. Um, so I see Sandy Burgo in the audience who um, has wonderful fellowships for investigative reporters and journalists. There's um, uh, the Cary Institute for Global Good has uh, residencies for people working on nonfiction, long pro long form projects, and I did a residency there. Um, food, you know, housing, three months to six months. You know, it was just a wonderful place. There's um, other fellowships that support book length projects. So I would say those two things, you know, a little bit at a time until you get enough that you can get some funding to finish the project. And for me, the funding was a book advance. You know, once I had the magazine article out and I had an agent who sold the proposal, I was able to have enough to live on for a year to write the book. Uh, I have no advice about writing books. Um, my longest piece I've written was probably the Wirecutter Guide to Wireless Plans, which was like 10,000 words. If any of you read the whole thing, thank you. If you, um, yeah. I think you just have to be very clear um, if you're a journalist or if you're a content writer and know that there's some outlets you won't be able to write for if you're doing that kind of work. I mean, I, I respect whatever decision any individual makes. For me, because I write for the New York Times, I can't you know, take money from a business that I might cover. So, um, I, but I think it, make, it works for a lot of people, especially if you're doing memoir or you're doing something where it won't be a conflict of interest. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely thought about it. I talked to an editor with uh, Chase where it's like, how can I be any more in business with them? My business card is a Chase card. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, like what I do have, what I've decided to do early on my own blog, it's a very long disclosures page, robpegarero.com slash disclosures or I break down like where my money's come from each year, who I've taken like free travel from to speak at a conference or whatever, you know, the my everyday tech environment so you can know that I'm an Android phone using person but I also have an iPad and my just general principles of what what motivates me to write about tech. And you know, you may not agree with the choices I've made but you will you will not be surprised by them, I guess. Yeah, someone said to me, you know, should I hide that I'm doing this content writing? And I'm like, that is the worst thing. Because then, you know, if your editors don't know and you're doing something, um, that's where you can get into trouble. It's if you're just totally open, it's on your LinkedIn page, it's on your proposals to clients, then at least everyone knows. Or I love the idea of a disclosures page. So let's move on to the third item, the, the client management, pitching clients, keeping them. I'll, I'll let you take the lead on that since you've got way more experience than oh, me. Oh, sure. So, um, so I sometimes like to think, treat your clients as if they were kidnappers and you're their hostage. <laughs> so like, you know when you're told, 
make see, have them see you as a person. You don't want to be just like an anonymous email address that they send an assignment to and the assignment comes back. They need to know who you are, how you work. You need to know who they are. So you want to build relationships with your clients. I think of myself as solving editors' problems. I'm never going to be a problem. I'm always going to be solving their problems. So if I meet someone, an editor at a conference, I'll say, okay, what's the part of your magazine that you always have trouble filling? What, you know, we're, that's a great way to break into any market is, what's your pain point? At the end of or the beginning of every month or the end of every month, and you're at deadline, what are you really having trouble with? Because that's the best first place to, to work. Um, <clears throat> whenever I have a new client, I, um, let's see. Okay, so I have this checklist uh, for a new freelance client. And pretty much every bullet point on this checklist has a really sad story of me not doing it and getting screwed. Um, <clears throat> so you always want to have a signed contract. That's right. You have to have a signed contract. Because if you don't have a signed contract, you will have no recourse for being paid. You don't always have to have it signed when you start the work, but I always like to at least get it by email because then I can look at the contract terms. And if you're a writer, you need to know if you're working work for hire, which means you're like a carpenter who just put together a bookshelf that somebody else designed, or if you own the copyright. And if you own the copyright, then you can sell it again. Um, it's much more valuable to you. So if, if I'm doing a work for hire, I try never to do a work for hire gig, but if I do, I'm gonna charge more because I will never again be able to use that content. Um, you need to know if they're asking you to indemnify them from any problems. I hate that clause, <laughs> such bullshit. Um, <laughs> and you know, a lot of this stuff you can negotiate. And if you can't negotiate, you can walk away or you can charge more. Sometimes, the client won't be able to give you a contract right away. And to me, that is a red flag. Um, I, I had a really, really promising client come to me and say, we want you to write about, this was when in the you know, financial crisis was happening, they wanted me to write about every TikTok of the legislation in Congress um, for like a dollar a word, two, three stories a month, long stories. I'm like, oh, this is great. But they couldn't give me a contract. And they wanted me to start writing I said, just, yeah, sure, just have the lawyer. That's another thing. If you can't talk to the accountant, you can ask, have the lawyer just email me the contract. And the contract had terrible terms. So I said, look, can we negotiate this? And I just couldn't get a straight answer. I kept going back and forth with the lawyer weeks and weeks. And if they are not willing to give you a fair contract, they're probably not going to pay you on time. They're probably not going to see you as a valuable partner in running their organization. Because that's really what you should be. So sign contract. You want the scope of the assignment, the deadline, the rate, contract terms, payment terms. Are you going to get paid when you deliver the product, or are you going to get paid when it's published? So if you're writing for a monthly magazine that has a long lead time, you want to get paid when you deliver the assignment. You don't want to get paid eight months later. Um, and then, of course, kill fee. If, if, you know, if they decide they don't want to use it, do you get 30%, 50%, or do you just get like, oh, so sorry, didn't work out? Um, then I also want to get written documentation, and it could just be in an email. Um, the timeline, the editorial timeline, and the expected number of revisions, which I learned because someone found me through Google, had an amazing like 5,000 word article, a dollar a word, it looked, seemed really easy, and I ended up doing seven revisions. Because this, this person, over the course of two months, every single devel news development, he wanted me to rewrite into the story. So since that experience, now I always say, okay, what's your timeline? How many edits? And I put it in an email so that if we end up on two edits and he wants a third, I say, okay, that's a little beyond the scope of what we already discussed. What's your additional rate for that work? Um, and then any items on the list above that aren't in the standard contract. I also like to talk through, okay, what's the approach of the story? Are there going to be sidebars? What kind of art is there? Um, do you have fact checking? Because as you're reporting, it's so much easier to get it done at the time than afterwards when they're like, oh yeah, we just need like data for three graphics and maybe um, contact information for four people we can shoot for photographs. 
Um, I also just like to talk about like my availability, their availability, how they like to communicate, email, phone, or whatever. And again, this um, checklist is on the ONA website in the speaker resources for this session. Uh, so I'm going to add some sort of practical advice about constructing a pitches. The whole line solving an editor's problem. I used to be an assignment editor, and it kind of sucks when you realize I have to fill this these 22 column issues by Friday or else. So the worst kind of pitch is, I'd really like to write for you sometime. So would everyone. A, a good one is, this is a good story. You haven't covered it, and I can do it better than anyone you have on staff. So that means you have to know the client, what they've done lately. You, you don't write the story in advance. Writing stuff on spec is usually a recipe for having a story you don't have a home for. <clears throat> but have a good idea of how it would structure, how its structure is going to go, who you would talk to, how soon you could deliver it. If the editor does not respond right away, do not send in any interest follow-up. I hate it when I get it from PR Flax, and I, I've had to sort of beat it into my head, do not do that. Find some way to say how the story's changed. You could say, well, you know, this, this app now has X many more people uh, using it. You know, I've been able to talk to this many other people. I found another example. Something must have changed, or even, you know, this, this executive still hasn't gone to jail. Let's, let's do something about that. Find some way to show that, you know, you have an interest in the story and, you know, you're showing some, origi ori some originality. Um, at least if you've done business with a company before, it doesn't hurt to ask for 10% more than what they offer. They will not always say yes, but if you don't do that, then you'll have that little voice in your head saying, I could have had just a little bit more money out of this thing. Um, once you get the story, my weakest part as a freelancer is time management. Like right now, earlier today, I had meant to do a little more work on a story that uh, I owe, and I didn't, and that means I may have to work on a Sunday, and I was really hoping I could sleep in tomorrow, which being a dad means sleep until like 8 a.m. instead of 7. <clears throat> um, so that's tough. You know, when you're working from home, the nice thing is if you want to take a nap in the afternoon, you can. I'm really sure one after lunch, five minutes really helps out. You know, you, you can run over to Costco and only spend five minutes in the line, not 20. But you have to get the stuff done. You don't have an editor standing over your shoulder with a stopwatch or whatever. And so you have to find some way to make sure that you're making enough progress on this. And when you may owe stories to three different people in a week, that can be tricky. And, you know, maybe five years from now I can do a 2.0 version of this and offer really concise advice. But, yeah, you got to sort of have the schedule in your head. What do I owe when and to whom? Yeah, and I use, I use Toggle, T-O-G-G-L, to track my time um, because that helps keep me accountable to myself for how long I'm going to spend on every project. I use Google, Google Calendar to schedule my day. So if I know I'm going to spend five hours on that project, I look in my week and say, okay, when am I going to do those blocks of work? <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to say is, as Rob was saying, everything is negotiable. It's not just money. So you can ask for better contract terms, as we were talking about before. I am amazed how many times I get a contract that's work for hire, or it has an indemnity clause, and I say, hey, my lawyer, because you want to blame someone else, my lawyer hates me to sign these kind of contracts. Is, is, there, is there any way we could talk about these two clauses? And I've had clients say, oh, yeah, we have a different contract, and send oh, me the I've good contract. I've had with that. I usually yeah. get stuck. I mean, the work for hire thing, it sucks, but most of the time that's what it is, and it doesn't mean I can't take the notes, the knowledge I have from doing the story, and then try to sell some version of it somewhere else. Yeah, I'm I just can't self-plagiarize. Yeah, I'm surprised. I, I got for a very big media company sent me a work for hire contract, and I said, my lawyer really doesn't like me to sign work for hire. Can, you know, can you do anything else? And they said, oh yeah, here's the other contract. The other contract, I kept That's the copyright for. after the 60 days. <laughs> In terms of money, um, can you do any better? Or more would be better? Or is what's your budget? You know, open-ended questions can sometimes get you more money. Um, you also could get more work. So, for instance, I was asked to write a blog for a journalism website, and it was a set 375 per post. And I'm like, well, that's really low for you know 800 words. Could I do like a two-part piece, like the pros and the cons of the issue? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. So that's 750. 
That's pretty much the same amount of work to report those two blog posts instead of just one. So if you know, you can find ways to make it work for you and also work for the client. Um, in, in addition, you can sometimes negotiate a longer deadline. So if the money's not as great as you would like, but you want to book it for that month, you can say, okay, can we can I turn it in later? And that lets you book it for that month while you keep marketing. You can work on that. I always like to have every hour in my day full of work. So you can work on that piece while you're also marketing for other stuff, as opposed to, oh my gosh, the deadline's right away, right away, I have to finish this up, and then you finish it, and you're at a dead standstill. You haven't been doing that marketing all along. Um, the other thing I would say about um, clients is, if someone comes to you who doesn't have a set rate, who's like a non-traditional organization, a, no a nonprofit, or someone who wants you to work, and they ask you to name a rate, never name a rate over the phone. Send them a proposal. So I have a standard one-page proposal, again, that I'd be happy to share with anyone who wants me to email it to them. And so I use the same language over and over. It starts with, thank you for your interest. As you know, I have 20 years of experience writing for X, Y, and Z in all these fields. That becomes a marketing document for you. It reminds them that you are not just an email address, you're a human being, you have lots of experience, you add a lot of value. And then I have bullet points that you know, itemize the value that I'm adding and what I'm gonna deliver. So that way they can see the total dollar cost that's gonna ha that they're gonna pay. My hourly rate is really high because I'm a super efficient worker. So if you just name the rate, and most journalists are super efficient workers compared with civilians because, <laughs> because we work on deadlines. And so if you just name an hourly rate, any civilian organization is going to be like, oh my gosh, no, we usually pay $35 an hour. Well, that's because your people take 10 times as long as I do. So always, you know, whenever possible, figure out in a 20-minute phone call what's the scope of the project and then send a one-page proposal. It won't take more than half an hour and you'll end up landing the gig when they would have been scared away by your hourly rate. So I'll close with just a few words about one unpleasant aspect of freelancing is sometimes the clients go away. I've been doing this since 2011. In that time, uh, I only have one of the anchor clients I did at the end of that year, which I didn't have when I started freelancing in like May. And so the first couple of times an anchor client goes away, either the site goes bust, they pivot to video, uh, your editor leaves and a new one comes in who has their own crew of freelancers. It's alarming because you see this big hole opening up in your income. Um, I've done it enough times so now I no longer freak out completely. I'm just like, well, I'm going to have to figure this one out. Uh, you do need some kind of core. You need to have resiliency so you can take these hiccups, these bumps, and get through it, whether it is you know, your family, uh, your church, your temple, your mosque, your bar, <laughs> something that keeps you grounded and so you can realize that you know, we'll figure it out. The thing is, you need that working full time in a newsroom too. Yeah, I, I would say the reason I love freelancing is it makes explicit that I have to be actively managing my career all the time. I have to be actively tending those clients, anticipating who's gonna go away, trying to replace them with someone else, but every single journalist should be doing that active management. And at least as a freelancer, I'm forced to. And you don't have a single point of failure in your income. Right. Um, right. And I, I would also say the people you need to know to succeed are probably in this room. Networking with other freelancers has been my absolute best resource. Because other freelancers, you can compare notes on good and bad clients. When they get busy, maybe you're slow. When I started freelancing, my friend Fong Lee had been a reporter for the Washington Post, you know, national magazine award winning, like brilliant, very successful. And she introduced me to an editor at the Washington Post magazine who assigned me my first long form story, which was a huge thing for my career. I'm like, I'm never gonna be able to pay her back. It's, I'll have to pay it forward. Well, three years later, she was having a slow time and I was able to refer her a client. So you never know who's gonna be able to help you out. If you help out other people and just spread the wealth, they will help you out in the future. And, um, and a lot of us really aren't competitive. We have overlapping interest areas, but often there's a, enough to go around. Um, it's really hard to freelance, okay? You have to have a good reason that you wanna be out there every day. So a lot of people start to freelance and then they 
go, go, go back into getting a full-time job. So the clients who find a good freelancer are going to stick with you. And when you, when you build that group, um, I have two different in-person networking groups in D.C. that we meet every month. Um, you stick with that group and, and you help each other out. So with that, can we help you out? What other questions can we answer? Um, are, introduce yourself to a client? Yeah. Or a potential like, client? Yeah, like a brand new client, uh, probably a big company. Um. So the communications director is a really good first point of contact um, at companies or nonprofits. If, if that person doesn't assign freelance work, they often know who does. So if you're looking through your network, like on LinkedIn, if you just search people you know who have communications director in their title, that often is a good point. Is that the question you were asking? Yeah. Do you ever get familiar with the freelancers union yes. in New York and is there a resource that you would know the union is because they have stuff to put materials back in. And related to that, either of you have um, seen the reason to get general liability insurance and stuff like that? So I am a member of the freelancers union and I, I, they don't really have any events around DC so I haven't done much with it, but I like what they're doing. I like the fact that they for years have been trying to address issues like health insurance. Um, so as far as liability, that is something that has been on my mind because a friend of mine, Mike Masnick, runs a really good tech policy site called TechDirt, and he, he tees off on stupidity, of which there is a great, there's a great surplus of it in the tech policy world. And one of it was this guy who's been running around saying, I invented email for this uh, state college in New Jersey in 1977, which is bullshit. And he said so, and the guy sued him, specifically this guy, Shiva Ayodurai, uh, the same lawyer who sued Gawker into oblivion. And uh, Mike took it to court and a judge threw out the suit, as well he should have. But yeah, that's nervous. So I have not yet, but I have been thinking about it. It's one of these things on my to-do list that I mentioned, my crappy time management. Um, yeah. So I, um, is it a question related to that or a different question? Okay, so I um, investigated liability insurance and it was just too expensive to work. So what I do is if I have a story that's sensitive that I'm worried I might get sued, I talk specifically with the editor about, you know, are you guys gonna stand behind me on this? And I get a commitment that um, the publication will bear the cost of any um, lawsuit. And that's why you don't want to sign an indemnity clause because the indemnity clause means that you individual are gonna pay the cost of the lawsuit. I'd like to think that if I get sued by somebody claiming they invented email, I, I'm in pretty good terms with the people at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, so I'll hopefully we'll never come to that. Yes? So yeah, so so this is why I use the checklist. So whenever I get a new project, I go through the checklist, and you can do it quickly on the phone with the editor to, to get a sense. Sometimes the only way to figure it out is to do it. But the more that you do it, the better you'll get at estimating it. And I really do think it helps. Like I start a, a Word document and I write at the top, this is my target number of hours. And I use toggle to track my time whenever I'm working on that story. And when I get close to the total, I'm like, okay, I gotta wrap this up. And sometimes you're off, but the more you do it, the better you get. Um, and uh, was that the whole question? No, this is the uh, toggle site? Yeah, yeah. But there's lots of time tracking um, as well. Um, and just you know, setting aside blocks of time that you're gonna freelance, um, trying to be disciplined, so. The first story you do for a client is always the toughest because you're not sure, like, what, the big one, what's the editor going to be like? Uh, the second one is easier, and, and so on. 
uh, in the red. That's a great question. So how do you generate story ideas on a new beat? Um, well, certainly, if you're targeting a specific market, a specific publication, you want to read the publication. Um, the, another great resource is mediabistro.com, yeah. which has these how to pitch um, fact sheets of what that market's looking for. Obviously, if you can get any inf inside information from those about what they're looking for, often it's the small parts of the publication that are the easiest to break in. So, you know, look at those. I often find um, <clears throat> being in DC that, like, the congressional record or the <clears throat> The Federal Register are sometimes good places to get story ideas. Um, but I would just start following the trades and look at the th kinds of things that get covered. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards as well. And if anyone needs to leave and they want to leave their email address, feel free to walk up and just write it down here, because I know it's getting close. In the third row. <laughs> yes, I was trying to count one, two, three. All right, who gets the last question, I guess? Well, it depends. I mean, so this is something I've had to break like three different editors through. Uh, South by Southwest, getting a press pass to that really sucks, and you need an editor to grovel for you, unless you're an influencer, in which case you got your own problems. Uh, most of the time, you should be able to say, you know, I'm covering this for so-and-so. Uh, some events, they'll ask you to submit, like, clips you've done before. So you sort of have to gauge, is it going to be easier if your editor can do it? Uh, and again, you know, smaller events are better. And as a general rule, to sort of answer what you asked about before, scarcity is a good concept to keep in mind. Are you at some event where other people are not? You know, have you had some experience gone someplace where other people haven't been to. It's easier to sell something about that than to say, you know, I too would like to write an essay about, um, I don't know, Apple getting rid of the headphone jack, which I've done that essay, Apple's stupid, but a lot of other people have plowed that ground. Oh, another great resource is the writer's market. So that's where I got my first clip, and it's just a database of everyone who hires freelancers. So the first ones are the hardest. Once you are work, once you have one freelance clip, then you can say, "I write for places like X." Um, if you're, you know, trying to get a press pass, or if you're introducing yourself to a source, once you have two clips, you can say, "Oh, I write for places like X and Y." I sometimes will say when I'm trying to get access, I'm reporting this as a pitch for. X, even if I don't have a commitment from the editor. So there's ways to get around it. And maybe you have time for one more question. You had your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a condition right now where I just got graded on my thesis. And it looks like I've done well, but I have also just had a couple of students that have had a similar problem. Um, I'm a data journalist and I deal with design in general, and I just have had a problem with the design being able to come out of the data. I have created documents that show that I'm That's a great question. Do you have any? Well, it seems like I would sort of try to do that through in-person networking. You know, you find some way to meet someone who knows the editor you've worked for and done the, you know, the, the boring but well-paying stuff. And, you know, see, because what you're trying to do, having been an assignment editor, your big worry is someone 
talks a big game and then doesn't deliver, and then you have, you know, this 22-inch hole, see how old I am, column inches, uh, that they got to fill. Um, and so if someone is a known quantity that they've written for someone you know and they were happy, that takes a lot of anxiety off an editor's mind. Yeah, I would say probably you'll have to do it like for free, maybe, or on a volunteer basis. So um, also look at your professional associations. Like they may have a need for that kind of skill. If you want to volunteer, you know, for ONA to do something that you that will help you develop those skills. So look for opportunities, or your school even. You know, if see if see report. if a professor needs help with that kind of project, or know someone, so that you can um, at least get it on your resume. Yeah, if, if you're going to work for free, try to do it for an actual charity and not some <laughs> giant for-profit company. Great. All right. Um, Oh, the National Press Club has a freelance committee also. I think they meet there, they have, they have events there too, and then they, they do a book fair, um, so that, that's a good thing to go and sort of network with. Um, yeah, I'm not helpful. yet a member, but maybe I should be, we'll see. Thank you very what much. What a great session, thank you all so much. Thanks, guys.